everyone, and welcome to tonight's uh, webinar. Uh, my name is Shelby Richardson, and we're gathered uh, here tonight at the uh, Unity Center in Chicago, um, where we will have uh, John Bechtel, who will uh, speak to you today on his recent vi visit to China. That was uh, in May uh, 26 through June 3rd. Uh, he visited China uh, as a representative of the Communist Party USA, along with uh, Carol Wyndham. There was a, that was a celebration of the 200th anniversary of Karl Marx's uh, uh, birth, and it was hosted by the Communist Party of China. Representatives of over 70 other communist, socialist, and worker, workers' parties also participated. Afterwards, they toured several cities, including Beijing, Shenzhen, and Anhua province. Uh, and uh, as I said, we are fortunate uh, tonight to have uh, John to fill us in on uh, 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 that visit uh, and uh, the coverage uh, that uh, he made. And you should also know that much more is also written in the uh, people's world uh, on that uh, uh, trip. So uh, without further ado, I want to invite John Bechtel to come before you tonight. Thank you. Well, <clears throat> thank you, everybody, and um, welcome to our audience, too. We, we're going Facebook Live with this. Um, I uh, First of all, I just want to say that, you know, China is an immense and endlessly diverse country with a long and complicated history undergoing rapid and profound changes. And I'm the first one to admit that I'm no expert, and there's only so much that Carol Whittem and I were able to see in the few days that we were there. There's so much that I don't know and much more that uh, we can't even fit into this presentation, although I'll try to answer as best I can any questions. And I'm sure there are others who I know who are here who have also been to China and can uh, share their experiences. But I hope it gives you a snapshot of China, a society and dynamic motion. And more importantly, regardless of your opinion, everyone should be aware of what China is attempting to achieve and its growing impact on the world. I hope this discussion encourages you to learn more and to make your own visit there one day. And of course, to read uh, the coverage in the people's world uh, not just the articles that uh, Carol and I wrote, but I, I know we have ongoing coverage. Um, and also, we'll try to repost on the party website our uh, photo, uh, our slideshow, including uh, pictures, uh, a video of our experience on one of the high-speed trains, which are uh, being built all across uh, China as we speak. <clears throat> well, a lot, is, a lot of what happened in China can be traced to the economic and social reforms adopted in 1978 and opening up to the global economy under the leadership of Deng Xiaoping. This took a lot of courage on the part of the Communist Party of China leaders coming so soon after the end of the Mao era. And they were fully aware of the tremendous risks they were taking. The reforms ushered in what's called the socialist market economy or mixed economy, a recognition the old model of socialist development patterned on the Soviet Union's centralized economy, total public ownership and wage leveling was a failure. The old model didn't fit China's economic and social reality. The reforms were a recognition development dependent on engagement with a globalized economy, even when the U.S. and other imperialist powers set the rules. The reforms allowed China as a developing country to accumulate capital by introducing mixed forms of property and essentially be a low-wage manufacturing zone 
of consumer items for the capitalist world. The reforms were a shift to a model based on the principle to each according to their work. The first reforms were carried out in the agricultural sector after 18 courageous farmers signed a secret pact to split up communal lands with earnings based on production. Production increased immediately and dramatically. Instead of being persecuted, the farmers who we met uh, in a little town called uh, Jinghua <clears throat> became national heroes. The reforms were extended to the entire agriculture oh, and then the manufacturing and service sectors. The changes since 1978 are staggering and unprecedented in human history. China has leapt from underdevelopment to a middle economy with moder a modern infrastructure. It has surpassed the US in retail sales and within a decade will be the world's largest economy measured by GDP. 700 million people have been lifted from extreme poverty which will be eliminated completely in the next three to five years. Let that sink in. Extreme poverty will be eliminated in the next three to five years. Almost all Chinese will live in a, what they call a moderately prosperous life by the year 2020. Economic growth is nearly 7% a year and China accounts for 30% of global economic growth. The country poured more concrete from 2011 to 2013 than the US did in the entire 20th century. Again, let that sink in. That's just a phenomenal amount of development. Wages still low by US standards have risen by 64% since 2011 and are now on par with Portugal and South Africa. Total state ownership of the economy and strict central planning ended. Roughly 60% of fixed investment in the Chinese economy is still in publicly owned or publicly controlled enterprises with a minority stake, minority private stake. The government directs social investment in education, healthcare, housing, transit, and controls armaments, energy production, oil and petrochemicals, telecommunications, coal, uh, coal mining and aviation and shipping. However, the breakneck pace of development has come at a cost, including subsuming workers' rights to overall development, growth of the capitalist class, including billionaires who are the source of much of the corruption, economic inequalities, disparities between urban and rural, and severe environmental problems. According to President Xi Jinping, China is the world's largest developing country in the primary stage of socialist construction, attempting to overcome a huge contradiction between its own imbalanced growth and rapidly growing expectations and cultural needs of the people. Today, China is carrying out bold new economic, social, and governance reforms that extend decades into the future. They are steps on the way to building a modern, what they call a modern, democratic, culturally advanced, harmonious and sustainable socialism by the year 2050. You know, when I first heard that uh, leaders, the Communist Party leaders in China said that it would take 100 years to build socialism, I thought that they were out of their minds. But, you know, it is, it's the way they have it, you know, laid out and the way they envision it, it's going to take 100 years if you consider that the revolution took place, you know, in 1949. These reforms include Made in China 2025, a 10-year program to make China a global high-tech manufacturing power and radically increase productivity, which is today about one-third uh, that of the U.S. economy, through uh, innovation and cutting-edge digital technology and artificial intelligence. Until now, China has complete, competed with other developing countries to produce 
consumer goods for advanced industrialized economies. In the future, newly cr created industries will satisfy the rapidly growing domestic market and then compete with capitalist economies in the manu advanced manufacturing and technological sectors. China plans to create a world-class system of universities, research institutions, and hospitals to attract world-class scientific and technical talent. Mind-boggling projects to modernize its infrastructure and move 250 million people into mega cities are underway. They include knitting together a mega metropolitan capital region of 130 million people linking Beijing, Tianjin, and Hebei, a 700 million, uh, a 700 miles south to north water transfer project, bridge and tunnel systems under the ocean, a new million, new million person cities being built from scratch, and a 35,000 kilometer high speed rail system. And as I mentioned, we got a chance to to ride on that, and it's a very modern and smooth uh, rail system. But the idea being that with high-speed rail, people can live much further distances from where they work, and they're able to travel very quickly to to get to work. The economic reforms also depend on China opening up wider and wider to the global economy. Another reform is shifting to a sustainable path of development and building what they call an ecological civilization. This concept of building an ecological civilization is now incorporated and in part of the constitution of China. This comes in response to environmental destruction, which came with industrialization and the growth of a widespread environmental movement and consciousness in response. And it also helps that the president and head of the Communist Party of China is an ardent environmentalist. Only an eco-socialist oriented society can move with such unity, purpose, and speed. And China is a global leader in the fight against the climate crisis. China is the world's biggest investor in renewable energy, including solar panels. Plans were halted to build 150 coal-fired plants, and installation of filters on the remaining plants is nearly complete. China sells more electric vehicles than Europe and the U.S. combined, and passed laws to create a, what they call a circular economy, that is, reuse, recycle, and remanufacture. The country is constructing six mega wind farms and carrying out the largest reforestation project in the world. Just a few years ago, Beijing was plagued with regular sandstorms originating in Inner Mongolia. Planting what they call a Great Green Wall has largely contained the sandstorms. However, enormous challenges do remain. China still produces more CO2 than any other country, will require burning fossil fuels uh, as part of their development plan. And plastic is ubiquitous and a major source of the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. Although as of the beginning of this year, China will no longer import plastic waste from the United States and uh, the European Union. It's no longer gonna be a uh, dumping ground, you know. Um, and that has the plastics or the, you know, the garbage uh, disposal industry in a big uh, uproar. Where are they going to ship all their plastic now? Of course, you know, they're going to try to ship it to other developing countries as well. But anyway, from China's perspective, they're going to put an end to uh, it being a, a dumping ground. China sees the economic nationalism as a threat to its reforms and global economic development in general and is and refuses to be bullied by the economic nationalism of this administration, the Trump administration, and the tariffs that um, 
Trump is imposing. And of course, they retaliated with their own set of, of uh, tariffs and uh, are buying, you know, their like soybeans and other things, you know, and other other from other countries. Trump's trade war is part of a larger strategic approach to prevent China from becoming an economic rival and force it to abandon its socialist oriented economic strategy. This is something that China will never agree to do. The strategy includes Cold War like containment by building a white nationalist Christian alliance stretching from the US to Russia the aim of which is to preserve global domination of white ethno-dominated states. This is a racist concept that's been pushed by uh, Steve Bannon and others. U.S. imperialism has long tried, long threatened to restrict China's maritime access to the Pacific through a string of military bases all along the uh, island nations, you know, in that part of the world. Um, and China is, is challenging this containment by diversifying its trade routes and building a military presence in the South China Sea. And of course, this, as we know, has led to territorial and maritime disputes with many of its neighbors, including Vietnam. And while tensions remain, at least Vietnam and China are seeking a diplomatic resolution to this, to their their differences. China believes the world is entering a fourth stage of globalization, a process that has been unfolding for over 400 years, which is characterized by this new stage of globalization is characterized by the integration of global maritime and inland, inland economies and the digital communications revolution especially artificial intelligence. The US emerged as the world's sole economic and military superpower with the collapse of socialism in the former USSR and Eastern Bloc countries in 1989 and 91. And then after that sought to preempt future rivalries by integrating Russia and China into the global capitalist trade system. It continued its Cold War-like foreign policy by expanding NATO eastward and militarily encircling Russia and China. But changes in Russia and China, mounting crises and strategic military blunders have shaken the global capitalist world. Neoliberal globalization of the 1980s and 90s was characterized by deregulation, privatization, deindustrialization, dropping of tariff barriers and a race to the bottom. But meanwhile, a new stage of globalization in the eyes of the Chinese is emerging, whose goal is to improve people's lives. Trade takes place in an increasingly multipolar world, not a unipolar world, with alternative global financial institutions. The geographical center of globalization is shifting to Asia and the emerging economies. In this era, every country beginning with the US should invest substantial resources to rebuilding its own manufacturing base and modernizing its infrastructure and raising wages instead of scapegoating other countries. There's plenty of work and wealth to go around. Up until now, China has kept a low profile while tending to its domestic economy. But in this new era, China and emerging economies are ascending and the US and Western imperialism, those countries are descending. Whether this transition happens peacefully is up to US imperialism. China has increasingly engaged the global community and played a key role brokering the Iran nuclear deal, the Paris Climate Agreement, and in efforts to diffuse tensions between the United States and North Korea. China is promoting a new governing concept that fits the coming 
stage of globalization called, quote, building a community for a shared future for humankind. This concept, which parallels building a people-centered socialism, was first introduced by Xi Jinping in 2013. It is based on the idea of multilateralism, mutual respect between countries regardless of size, social system, fairness and justice in the global economy, mutual benefit in trade relations and win-win economic cooperation. It calls for working out disputes through dialogue and rather than confrontation for non-involvement in the internal affairs of other countries and opposes Cold War type economic and military alliances in favor of collective security. Development that is inclusive and sustainable. Diversity is celebrated and cultural exchange is elevated. It recognizes no country can solve problems of development, climate change, peace, poverty, disease, resource allocation, or security on their own. International relations are based on state-to-state -state relations and partnerships. And I would add that it would, it should involve a higher level of global working class unity. It would involve restructuring the international order and reforming global governance and financial systems established after World War II, such as the United Nations, and especially the United Nations Security Council, the IMF, and World Bank. In the meantime, China has built alternative international networks and relationships, including the Shanghai Cooperative Organization and BRICS, which is the association of the five major emerging economies, Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa. The world can ill afford a war between China, the US, and other capitalist powers. Delaying cooperation to address the climate crisis, the growing nuclear danger, and uh, continuing to allow vast economic inequalities between nations and people leads to nothing good for the human race. Better to build a shared community uh, for the uh, future of hum humankind. By far China's most ambitious project and part of this effort this new uh, concept is the project called the Belt Road Initiative, which was launched in 2013. It is a massive $1 trillion, and some say it may actually go up to two or $3 trillion in the end, development project comprising over 2,000 local construction projects. And these are big projects in themselves, infrastructure projects. It could boost, in the end, it's estimated that it could boost global economic development by 12%. Now, when you think about that, that's really pretty, uh, you know, pretty amazing. Once complete, 71 countries in Asia, Africa, and Europe, including some of the poorest, will be linked via six land and sea corridors. These corridors will feature modern infrastructure, rail and road transport, modern ports, electric grids, refining capacity, water sanitation, pipelines, and cultural exchanges. The, the uh, Belt Road Initiative is also a strategic plan to bypass any future threat of a U.S. economic blockade on China's eastern coast. To help fund the um, Belt Road Initiative, China is developing alternative financial institutions including the Asia Infrastructure Investment Bank and the New Development Bank, which also threatened to upend the international financial order. There are problems for sure with this massive project. And, uh, you know, the, I mean, just based on the size of it, uh, but also because of the relationship of China, which has got a lot of resources uh, and capital uh, and, you know, developing, other developing and very poor uh, countries uh, who lack, you know, some of the financial, lack the financial resources. And this has led, you know, to some complaints of 
uh, debt burdens and debt traps and, and so on. Uh, China disputes, you know, uh, much of this, but in any case, whatever problems there are, uh, you know, they have to be worked out. And certainly I think China's uh, willing to, to work them out. I want to say just a, a couple words on uh, democratic reforms uh, because they're much they're much a part of the whole picture here. China's experience with building working class democracy and democratic institutions is obviously different from experiences in the capitalist democratic republic. Republic. It also has to be understood from the perspective of their own history, culture, and traditions. China is in the primary stage of socialism and remains a developing country, according to what uh, Xi Jinping has said. And one could, could conclude that this also refers, this refers to both uh, the material basis of uh, developments in China, uh, which is in and of itself a, a precondition to achieving a people-centered democracy, and the democratic institutions civil society and political culture. Constructing a working class democracy is a conscious process and China is an evolving new democracy in that sense. The Communist Party of China freely admits to imperfections in socialist democracy, but to understand the challenges they face, you have to take into consideration 2,000 years of imperial rule, which ended in 1912 with the Xinhua Revolution, followed by civil war, Japanese occupation, and World War II. The Revolutionary War for Independence resulted in the founding of the People's Republic in 1949, only to be followed by the turmoil of the Great Leap Forward and the Cultural Revolution. China didn't pass through a bourgeois democratic republic phase. And during its history, a single party emerged as the leading, leading party. Authoritarian tendencies carried over from the Revolutionary War for Independence and establishment of the Socialist Republic. And vestiges of that you know, remain to this day. You just, you know, they just don't uh, disappear you know, overnight. Besides extending basic rights to education, healthcare, affordable housing, transit, and in clean environment to everyone, and ensuring equal rights before the law and the constitution, there is the issue of organs of people's government that allow for greater participation, decision-making, and, and management. In my estimation, creating effective democratic institutions really didn't begin until the reforms of 1978. And even then, many things were subsumed to developmental tasks. China's systems of, for example, of elections is hierarchical and each legislative body is drawn from the legislative bodies below. You call it three for three or something like that. Its system of participatory and multi-party consultative democracy, including the uh, participation of the uh, all Chinese uh, trade union federation is unique. I mean, the fact that the Chinese trade union federation is part of the governing apparatus, you know, is I think uh, in and of itself a very important uh, indicator, you know, of um, of the direction of things. The Communist Party of China is product is projecting governance reforms to fit the new era that expand grassroots participation and decision-making. An emphasis is being placed on establishing what they call a rule of law society, which along with the economic reforms comprise two wings of a bird, as they refer. A rule of law society means enforcing the constitution, developing judicial, judiciary and legal rights, regulatory bodies, streamlining government agencies, ensuring environmental and consumer protections. All of these things are in the works. National, state, and local direct elections are the goal, which of course will be free from the influence of corporate money as we you know, have to deal with here. And this is already happening. Uh, these direct elections are already happening in 
at a local level. And there's a whole wide variety of experiments that have been taking place, um, you know, over the last decade, at the, especially at the local level, um, you know, to try to figure out the best practices, uh, so to speak. These uh, democratic reforms also include reforms of the party, the driving force behind everything that has occurred that strengthen its role and bring it closer to day-to-day uh, -day life of, of working people. And that includes re reinvigorating Marxism as a revolutionary methodology. As Xi Jinping says, the party too must change with the times. And although an independent media has emerged since Deng Xiaoping, re reporters without borders ranks press freedom as very low. And there is widespread, widespread domestic social media, but as you probably know, Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube have been banned. At least I couldn't get them when I was there. So uh, the free flow of information in a world of cyber warfare and mass disinformation, as we know from our own experience in the last election, is a challenge facing every country. But Chinese citizens are finding ways around the censorship, which means it's ineffective and only generates resentment. A culture that places emphasis on the battle of ideas will have to be cultivated as part of any socialist democracy. As far as other rights are concerned, women are, are guaranteed equal rights under the Constitution, but winning them in reality is far more difficult, as we know. Uh, you know, the fight for equal rights in the United States, of course, is uh, on a different, um, takes place in a different terrain, but nevertheless, uh, it's an ongoing battle. Um, uh, over 80% of women are in the workforce, but vestiges of patriarchal society remain, including widespread domestic abuse, sexual harassment, property rights, and unwanted daughters. The presence of women in the party leadership and among elected officials is still scarce. The changes are afoot, including a new anti-sexual harassment law, and women now make up half of all university students. Gay and lesbian rights also lag. We were told attitudes toward gays and lesbians are like, the, like our US military don't ask, don't tell policy. But among China's young generation, things are changing very rapidly and there's a broad acceptance of LGBTQ rights. It will likely take transformative social equality movements to completely change attitudes, pass and enforce laws. These movements, many built through the social media, are evident in labor, the environment, and among women. And in, as our own experience, I think, especially with the fight for marriage equality tells us that public opinion can you know, change and people's attitudes can change very rapidly, you know, given the, the right leadership and the right uh, you know, environment uh, for those kinds of things to happen. So it seems, gives me a lot of confidence that things can happen relatively quickly, you know, given the right kinds of conditions. The, the image of Chinese socialism, positive and negative, will have a big impact on how people around the world, including uh, people in our own country and in the United States view socialism, whether they have a favorable or unfavorable attitude toward it. And the Communist Party of China maintains, and I agree, and I think it's the stance of our party that each country has its own path to socialism based on its own conditions, its own traditions, um, and its own struggles, its own realities. Therefore, China's model is not our model. Um, you know, it's far harder to build socialism than talk about it. I think that, to me, is one of the big lessons, at least of, you know, my visit there and uh, my visits to Cuba and also to Vietnam. It's far harder to build it, and you make a lot of mistakes, you know, along the way, and. Uh, you try a lot of things, uh, you make a lot of errors, and sometimes you even fail, you know, as happened in the Soviet Union. Um, 
so anyway, it's you know it's extremely difficult uh, to do, um, and it takes time. It doesn't happen overnight. Uh, you know, development of socialism goes through many different stages and, and processes. In any case, I think we're challenged to discuss the positive achievements that are taking place in China, but explain their unique history, problems, and shortcomings in a partisan way. And most of all, I think we have to draw the, the lessons, you know, from their experience, but to continue to, to develop our own collective vision of democratic, demilitarized, sustainable socialism and the democratic path that we project to get there. That's it. Okay, can you hear me? Can you hear me there? We can hear you. All right, so we'll uh, open the floor for discussion. We have to coordinate online and the audience. And so we will be very, uh, make every effort not to create a difficult situation. So what I suggest, Carrie, is that we take one person from online and then a person from the audience and we move uh, and we progress in that manner. So let's start with online. If you'd like to introduce a question or um, uh, make a comment, please uh, use click your raised hand uh, picture, your raised hand icon, and we can open your mic, okay? Ben Sears, your mic is open. Can you hear me, Dee? Yes, we, we can hear you. You can hear him, John? Can you John. hear him, John? Yeah, you can hear him. Go ahead, Ben. John, thank you for that, that talk, that report. I think I heard you say, when you since you've been back, uh, that you met a lot of people who were interested in what the US party had to say about global affairs. And I don't know, maybe the Trump administration and so on. But I'm curious, you were, what opportunities did you have to speak and who did you get to speak to about, about our party and about our, our own experience here? Uh, I, don't know, I guess everybody heard the question about, uh, you know, our, the ability for us to be able to talk about what's happening in the United States and uh, including, you know, with our own party. And um, well, as Shelby mentioned, when he introduced me, um, we were, Carol and I were part of a delegation that went uh, to the 200th anniversary of the birthday of Karl Marx. And, you know, it was a, that was a big deal in China uh, that whole month of May. There were celebrations all across the country, and you know they were they they also saw that as an opportunity to um, really elevate you know the uh, discussions of Marxism and uh, elevate um, you know the idea that uh, you know Marxism should be developed you know as a body of thought and and, and so on, uh, which I I found uh, you know really innovating interesting including you know the idea that it, it had to be uh, uh, you know innovative and uh, non-dogmatic and, um, and so on um, at that conference uh, there were a number of people who number of uh, parties who gave uh, you know um, remarks you know about uh, the Marxism in the 21st century and also it's application to their own particular uh, situations. Uh, we were one of the parties that were asked to speak um, and we participated uh, both there and, and uh, I would say, you know, they, I think because of the concern, you know, with uh, what Trump is doing and this uh, trade war, you know, that he initiated, they have real concerns, first of all, understanding exactly what the heck he's doing um, and wanted our opinion about it. They're, you know, they're 
see if they're really wanting to know what's going on in the United States. Uh, how could you elect, on the one hand, an Obama uh, one election, and then the next election elect a Trump? You know, uh, and that's that's kind of reflective of their concern about you know what is going on among the American people for one thing, but um, you know what what Trump is trying to do with this trade war. So. Uh, we, it gave us an opportunity, you know, to talk a lot about the political landscape of the United States. Uh, as we know, it's very complicated. Um, and also, uh, you know, some of the factors that were going into uh, this Trump trade war, including what I mentioned, but also, you know, his uh, effort to appeal to a, a base, you know, his base of supporters through economic nationalism and to whip them up you know, for the uh, coming election. Um, but that wasn't the only place. We, we got a chance to speak. And again, there were these exchanges with, which took place in just about every city that we went to. And uh, we were asked to, uh, you know, uh, certainly for our opinion about uh, what was going on, not only here, but also in China. I don't know if that answers your question or not. Okay, Carrie, let's take a, a question from the audience there in the center. Okay, John Wojcik. Yeah, I think I want to thank John for that report. I think the thing that stuck into my head the most uh, from what you said was it's much easier to much easier to uh, uh, to to building socialism is a lot more difficult than talking about. It. You know, I mean, I think that that's the thing, and I, I feel that very strongly. The only thing is, so all I have is questions. I don't have answers to anything uh, on this. But but one of, one of my questions, for example, is that a big chunk of our, our allies here, progressive allies, not only elected officials, but in the trade union movement, see Chinese government policy as harmful to the interests of a big section of American workers. You know, so I don't know to what extent there was any discussion about that, but that's obviously important for us. How do we deal with that? You know, it's not, <clears throat> we're not in a position where we're, I would think we're not in a position where we can just say, hey, we're for free trade, but, you know, when there are our, the leadership of all of our unions and people like you know, the progressive people from Ohio and everything. That's one thing. But the other thing is that the thing I don't understand is, and again, I don't say is the, the dichotomy. We, we always say the you know the the collapse of socialism. I prefer the term the defeat of socialism to collapse because the collapse implies that imperialism had nothing to do with that destruction of socialism. And they you know it was a dynamic thing there. Whatever internal problems they had, they also were attacked from all around. So I don't know what the Chinese you know, position on that is I agree and understand they don't want to follow the same model. But Deng Xiaoping, that was described as the beginning of great reforms, but yet, you know, one of the first things he did was invade Vietnam after they were liberated. The other, the other piece of it is this, capitalist foreign policy, socialist foreign policy are different. You know, you saw the, when the Soviet Union socialist countries were in Afghanistan, you saw education, selling of nomads, you saw it in Egypt, the building of the Aswan Dam, you saw it, I don't know, you saw positive developments. So far, where, where the Chinese are involved, like in Africa, I do see that indebtedness problem, and I don't see big benefits being skewed to the populations of the countries that they're dealing with. You know, so I don't understand that. And the billionaires, you know, I wouldn't hold it against anybody to have billionaires. We got tons of them. But I don't understand them having so many billionaires and having a bigger gap between their billion, their CEOs and their people. The, the, way, the only place where the wage gap is bigger, you know, I just came back from Germany, it's 30 to 1. Here in the United States, it's 500 to 1. In China, it's even bigger, you know, the wage gap. So I, these are all things I don't understand. I have no answers to them. But I'm hoping that we could, <laughs> you know, not from you, because I think you raised a lot of good issues. I agree with, with many of the things you said, but it's still those other questions. You know? Yeah. 
Well, I, I can't, I'm not going to address everything you said, John, yeah. but um, just a couple of things. One is the, on the economic reforms, you know, they, they, they also recognize that, um, you know, the, uh, at least from what I understood talking to people there, that, um, you know, the, uh, this issue of the billionaires, you know, was, I wouldn't say out of control, but it, it uh, posed a, a serious problem and in including a lot of, a lot of risks and um, they, some of these reforms are an effort to get, get a hold of that, you know, and, um, you know, in, including, um, you know, strengthening the regulatory uh, apparatus um, and trying to uh, curb the corruption. I mean, that's really, I think, uh, a lot of what comes down to some of the reforms is trying to curb curb the re the uh, corruption that has ensued, you know, from uh, uh, these billionaires and, and capitalist class mainly that affected not only elected officials but even in the party. You know, there's uh, there's that problem. Um, so I, I, as I said, I think that the economic reforms are in part attempting to address uh, some of these issues. Uh, including strengthening the, the role of not only the party, but also, you know, the battle of ideas, you know, against uh, some of the capitalist uh, ideology and, and so on. Um, you know, just kind of going back again to the issue of trade, you know, I, uh, I mean, I don't, I don't think there's any question that, um, you know, the way the global capitalist trading, you know, uh, system was 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 set up and in, in bringing China uh, into the global capitalist system that it set up an imbalance right away you know and that uh, in a lot of ways it was also a continuation of what corporations are already been doing you know outsourcing uh, production to uh, developing countries but it really accelerated it you know um, and of course, it created a lot of problems, you know, in in, in uh, the United States and in, in, in other advanced capitalist countries, including contributed to the deindustrialization de of regions and cities and, and so on. Um, but I want to make a, just a couple of uh, also, you know, kind of qualify that in uh, a couple ways. One is that, uh, you know, it was. This was this was not China. This was not China's fault. This was the corporations that did this. The U.S. corporations and transnational capital that did this. You know, um, and they, you know, because of their drive for products, profits, they sought uh, low wage zones and tried to wherever they could go. You know, around the world. Um, so that's and, and the U.S. government facilitated that, you know, uh, one administration after another facilitated that that uh, exodus of capital and the, the flight of jobs and, and, and so on. They were rewarded. Corporations were rewarded for leaving the country. Uh, so to scapegoat China, to put uh, especially a developing country, you know, that's trying to develop itself, I think would be wrong. Um, the other thing is that the U.S., for example, has not had a policy on manufacturing, its manufacturing industry and developing a manufacturing sector, its own, uh, you know, uh, domestic manufacturing sector. Um, to me, that, that's a huge issue that we should be demanding. When are you going to start investing money in, uh, you know, U.S. manufacturing sector? Um, to create jobs and tie it with a mass, uh, you know, infrastructure rebuilding project for the whole country. We could put everybody to work and raise wages, you know, and, and so on. Uh, so especially in these areas that have been deindustrialized de and that are feeling, you know, uh, still feeling the effects of, of the industrialization. So um, to me, the that has to be changed along with a uh, changing the global governance structure, you know, trade trade regime that 
uh, you know, a few years ago, um, I think it was Gephardt came up with this idea of a global minimum wage. Why can't that be discussed? See, I mean, and the, these capitalist corporations are the ones that are dominating this system. Why can't they rewrite the rules, you know, to make it uh, uh, also fair, you know? So um, anyway, I think that we have to kind of think along those lines to me as a way to solve it. And, and, and also it, what happens with these trade wars is that it ends up pitting U.S. workers against Chinese workers. Now they're the enemy. When the corporations are getting off scot-free, so uh, you know it has. To, we have to have to figure out a way to bring unity between the working class of our of our two countries. Uh, and I think that's what this kind of uh, foreign policy gets at. You know, with the uh, China's foreign policy in the future. Anyway, those are some. Thank you. Those are really good. Points. Okay, we'll take another question from online. Oh, your mic is open. Aloha, John. Thank you for this presentation. Um, this is Lowell from Hawaii. And um, I guess bringing a little skepticism, um, <clears throat> I think John opened up a little, um, a little bit of what I need to say about what's happened, what's happening with China and its so-called socialism. Um, I would say, first of all, you mentioned in your presentation about China wanting to move to a rule of a rule of law society, and what that makes me think of, and what we should be thinking of, um, is how after formal colonialism in Africa and the Third World, the United States and Britain pushed for similar rule of law societies because they wanted secure places for capital. So I think that's, when you said that, that's what made me, I, I thought about that. But I do think a lot about Africa and what is happening with this so-called socialist developing economy. Because I do not know of any other socialist developing economy that is building military bases, is extracting resources for cheap. Um, and, um, you know, yes, they're financing malls, they're building a railway, as did Britain in India. Um, but they are not, to my mind, and maybe like you, John, I'm not an expert on the internal affairs of China, but I am following the debates that are going on in Africa. Um, and they are debates pro and con about what China is doing, because as far as I can tell, this is a colonialism. This is the same thing that Europe was doing. Europe basically paved the road and China has moved in and extracting resources. So I think we should be a little bit skeptical of what is happening um, globally with China, because it looks like to me, China or socialism in China with Chinese characteristics is going to be a, a Chinese financed shopping mall in Namibia staffed by a local African girl stuffed with Chinese made goods. That's not development. That's not liberation. That's not the end of capitalism for the countries of Africa that have been exploited, as we all know, for centuries. Thank you. Um, yeah, well, uh, you know, low raises, I think some, uh, and also John had touched on that as well. These are, uh, you know, not, not easy, um, uh, questions and, um, you know, there, there, there are, there are some contradictory kinds of developments, uh, as I try to allude to, you know, in my uh, remarks, um, given, you know, the status of, of, uh, and level development of different countries vis-a-vis -vis even China. Um, and I think these are problems that, uh, as, you, as you pointed out, you know, uh, they're contentious um, and not everybody sees them, you know, in the, in the same way. Um, from my perspective, uh, 
you know, there the the issue of, of especially of, of of infrastructure and of connecting countries to the global economy um, is really a it's, it's kind of a key key issue um, because you know again they, they keep making the point that is the Chinese that uh, no country can develop in isolation you can't you can't develop if you're isolated from a global economy and of course uh, you know at the same time um, you know there has to be a fight to make the global economy and the trade global trade a fair you know fair and just economy it can't be just left uh, at an economy which is dominated by transnational capital and so on uh, but nevertheless to be part of the uh, global economy you know you have to in this day and age you have to you know you have to be you have to have uh, some very modern you know infrastructure um, and of course capital to go along with it uh, and so from my perspective you know these developmental projects are positives uh, whether they be ports or rail transit you know connecting countries uh, because they're going to promote trade, you know, and, and development. Um, and that's really, a, I think, a fundamental issue facing the world is development, you know, developing, uh, you know, uh, bringing countries from underdeveloped status, you know, to uh, development, to uh, pulling, uh, you know, millions of people out of poverty and, um, you know, creating the infrastructure that will go along with that. And I, uh, you know, I, I think that that's, at least in my mind, that's, that's what they're trying to be a factor in. Um, now, how that all shakes out in terms of finances is another issue. And I, I know I've read many of the same things about, you know, the debt traps and, and so on. And, um, you know, some of the, uh, uh, you know, the, uh, what do you call them, like agreements that have been reached that are maybe uh, one-sided. Uh, again, those are, you know, those are things that are being debated out and, uh, you know, but overall, I, you know, I, I think that these developmental projects are a positive. I and mean, you take a look at, again, what this Bell Road Initiative and what it, you know, what it uh, portends to do, you know, linking, uh, you know, the whole, from China all the way to to Europe and bringing, you know, going into areas, you know, linking areas that have been isolated and, and so on. I think these are really, to me, they're they're positives, and you can't get around issues of development. Um, but again, we want to fight to do it in a way that's fair and just, uh, and that it's as they put it, win-win for everybody. Uh, that has to be a fundamental part of the whole thing. Okay, let's take a question from the audience there, Carrie. Okay, next is Melissa. Uh, that was a great report, John. Um, you talked about the fossil fuel in, uh, resources there in China. Will they be able to do away with those, uh, the fossil fuel in industry? And if so, how would they go, you know, how would they go about doing that? Yeah, the question is uh, about doing away with the fossil fuel industry and, and uh, in particular burning coal. Uh, yeah, that's their goal. Their goal is to is to have a completely sustainable society. I don't know the year, um, but uh, it's uh, definitely in the works. And um, you know, they they uh, just recently they they made a, they had made a goal about uh, solar. Uh, production from solar panels, and they decided to double that, you know, they double, to double that goal. Um, and at the same time, I think I mentioned in my remarks that uh, they uh, have put, you know, they stopped building a whole number of uh, coal-fired power plants um, and put these scrubbers, you know, on, on all the rest of them. Um, so it didn't, it obviously hasn't eliminated the problem uh, and coal, coal burning power plants are going to be part of their picture for a while. Uh, but when you combine the, um, you know, the, uh, these mega wind farms with the solar energy and geothermal, I mean, they're, they're committed to 
you know, a sustainable society, you know, and getting off coal. Uh, as we know, I think they, they still import a lot of coal from the United States, actually, from, uh, uh, I think it's the Powder River Basin in Wyoming. Um, and, but again, that's, uh, they, yeah, their plans to get off it. And uh, if they, you know, if they take bigger steps in that direction, that's going to be a very important, um, you know, for the fight for climate, against the climate crisis. Okay, let's take one more online and then we'll end for tonight. Alvaro, you'll have the floor. Hi, John. Thank you for your report. Uh, very good. I mean, it's a great thing that we're talking about the second largest economy in the world as on the path to building uh, socialism, initial st uh, stages of building socialism. So that's actually very wonderful. And um, so that is, that's a good discussion. Um, I just wanted to say that uh, as far as the, uh, as the trade problem uh, between, that Trump has started with uh, China, they're trying to make China a scapegoat for the uh, problems that our working class faces here instead of the corporations. And uh, so a very good question would be certainly why have we not joint belt and road initiative? Uh, we certainly need a lot of uh, Chinese dollars to build, re, uh, build our, and rebuild our infrastructure. So I think that would be a good point to bring up in the future is that we should be talking about those kind of things instead of uh, uh, trade wars with, uh, with the uh, Chinese people and the Chinese working class. So thank you for your report. Yeah, thanks, Oliver. I couldn't agree more. In fact, I, I think I just saw the other day where, where uh, Canada, you know, is, wants to be part of it. So, yeah, I mean, we're not that far away. Right? Uh, <laughs> OK. OK, I suggest we're just two minutes after the hour. So we're right on time uh, in terms of ending. I'd like to thank everyone for participating. Uh, those of you in the audience there in Chicago can continue, uh, but we will um, shut down the, unless you want to continue taking questions, John, we can continue. Uh, I can, can I, I can continue. Can you grab something? Five more minutes? <laughs> Five more minutes. There are a couple more questions here in the audience here. First one, Scott Marshall. I'm just curious. I thought it was a very good report, and I, I think a lot of people went into it. I'm curious if you got a feel for what the debates are within the party about these questions. Because they're obviously, I mean, when I was there, there were huge debates, and it had to do with uh, national state-owned enterprises versus you know capitalist-owned enterprises and special privileges for capitalist enterprises that and there were all kinds of things like that there were issues all kinds of issues about what kind of investments to make and what not to make and stuff like that so i'm just wondering it seems like in the in a lot of the press um it seems like they're have less debate in the party than they did in the past. But I mean, you wouldn't know that from, I mean, maybe you got a feel for what the actual debates are within the party and whether, you know, I mean, one of the big debates was also about whether uh, billionaires should be in the party or not. Um, those kinds of debates were taking place. And so anyway, I'm just wondering what kind of debates are going on now, because it sounds like with this lifetime guarantee thing for leadership and all that kind of stuff, that it's uh, maybe going in the wrong direction on some things. Uh, well, you know, I didn't really, I didn't get a chance to hear about the uh, debates going on, except, I mean, I got the, I got the sense that there's been a kind of a shift. I mean, yeah, some of the, some of the same issues are, are roiling, you know. Um, but I got a kind of got a sense that um, there's uh, more agreement, you know, in terms of especially curbing some of the excesses and moving in that direction. Um, and uh, you know, some of the so some of the issues that may have been dividing the party before have 
I think are have been uh, there's more agreement on them. I mean that's just my sense about it. Uh, just on on the uh, the uh, issue of uh, lifting the term limits. Um, I mean I wouldn't call it uh, exactly lifetime. Uh, you know whatever how did you put it uh, presidency or whatever. Um, I think you just ended the limits, right? Yeah, well, it actually was, uh, it already had that in the party constitution. Uh, this was lifting it in the assembly because they wanted to sync the two uh, in the parliament, national parliament, you know. Um, and from their, their perspective, at least from what I, just talking to people, um, that was, the one of the motivating factors but the other one was that they feel that xi jinping is uh the leader that they need right now you know and the changes that they're going through and um you know that rather than cut his uh term you know uh, limit his terms that you know and maybe an, an additional term or whatever would be in order i mean that's just from their from what I could gather, you know. Can I just one more? Yeah. <laughs> um, and by the way, I just, just from reading, you know, uh, some of his uh, work and so on, I, my sense is that he's a pretty innovative thinker. And, you know, he's the one that's come up with these different concepts of uh, the ecological civilization, the, um, uh, building a community for a shared future. Um, and there are a few others that I kind of touched on, but he's he's kind of been the, the driving force behind a number of the more innovative concepts, as far as I can tell. Just, just on the, um, one of the things I've noticed from the outside is that the participation of the Chinese labor movement in international labor forums is not happening. In fact, they're withdrawing more and more. They used to send delegations. Sometimes they didn't vote, but they were there and they talked and they would do presentations. And they're really, they used to do with the WFTU. They used to do with actually all the world federations. They used to invite them and they're not really doing that anymore. And I wondered if that was, if there was, I mean, it, that makes me feel like the labor movement is less uh, influential than it was. Mm. Not sure. Uh, well, only thing I can say is, you know, what our experience was there. And we met with, uh, I think it was the International Secretary for the All China uh, Federation of Trade Unions, and um, he he said that they're part of the governing board of the ILO, right? And uh, that they have uh, relationships with trade union federations all over the world, including here. Uh, they've been uh, they've been in in uh, close. He he says that they've been in close cooperation with the AFL-CIO. Um, they were actually planning a visit here, but um, because of the trade war, they they dropped it. Um, and they've cooperated on a number of things, including um, you know uh, Chinese-owned plants here in the United States that are owned by. Chinese capitalists, um, or had bought bought um, U.S. plants, uh, and the AFL-CIO and other the unions that were in you know that were covering the uh, those plants were concerned about whether or not uh, the Chinese owners would continue with the contracts, and so they reached out to the Chinese labor movement and actually brought them into the process, and they were helpful. According to them, you know, in, in maintaining some of these um, uh, contracts. So uh, anyway, that's what that's that's their from, from what we heard. I I don't know from other perspectives, but um, I guess it's kind of related to what just Kelly asked. Kelly was different way. Um, based on the fact that you know a lot of our you know, manufacturing companies, everything has gone out there to China. How well organized is the labor movement now? Are they 
organized or what's going on here? Uh, well, this is from what I was told, what we were told when we met with the uh, All China Federation of Trade Unions. They have uh, 308 million members in their labor movement. Um, that's about 44% of the uh, total number of workers there. Um, their aim is to organize 90% of the workforce. Um, about 90% of the Fortune 500 companies that are active, that are basing operations there, are organized. Um, the, the issues that are, are debated, of course, and even you know, in international trade union circles are uh, how effective they are as a labor movement. Because uh, again, and this kind of gets to I think what I was talking about earlier that you know during during their drive for economic development they subsumed you know in a lot of ways they uh, kind of cut corners in terms of workers' rights and the um, labor movement the official labor movement uh, kind of became a, a you know, it, it, it was more interested in making sure the production ran smoothly, you know, including at these um, production facilities that were owned by capitalist corporations. Um, however, there's been in the last, I don't know, 10 years maybe, there's been a wave of strikes, you know, off and on, you know, that have gone on, including very recently. Um, and a lot of them are, what we would call wildcat strikes. You know, they just, they're spontaneous, they happen without the okay of the local labor, you know, the labor movement. Um, but they're, they're directed at, mainly at these foreign corporations that are trying to skirt the laws, that are, um, you know, not paying workers, that are reclassifying them, uh, that are, um, you know, shorting them on their paychecks and, and so on. And yeah, so uh, anyway, that that's what a lot of these these strikes have been about, including most recently. Um, I I don't know. I, I think that that will have an effect, you know, uh, on the labor movement there. Uh, this activism that's taking place, I, I think that it's going to have an effect. And even, um, you know, Xi Jinping, you know, says the labor movement has to change. It has to respond to the workers, you know, more. So I think that kind of opens the door to changes. And I know uh, there's still, you know, a lot of problems and questions, but I think, again, this is one of those examples where I think the uh, things are evolving and you're trying to find, the labor movement is trying to find its footing, you know, in these under these circumstances. Let's not forget, you know, that, the labor movement in China um, was founded in 1925, and it was the party, you know, that actually founded it. So, you know, they were the, the ones that it was top priority. In fact, the first laws during the 1949 revolution, you know, when the uh, People's Republic was established were around trade union rights and, and labor rights. And so, um, Again, I think it, it, a lot of it has to do with these issues of development, and and uh, they'll they'll they're going to evolve. Since thing. you're taking more questions, there is another question online. Uh, Henry, your mic is open. Um, I, one of the issues that I know gets uh, is going to be raised by people who discuss socialism in China and so forth is the whole issue of, of civil liberties and of the guaranteed role of rule of, of a single party. And um, what would you say about that if, uh, you know, if somebody raises it to you that, you know, this is all very well and good, but the fact of the matter is that civil liberties are still restricted. There's only one party that can legally function and so forth. What, what would you say about that? Yeah. Yeah, well, I think, uh, I mean, obviously from our perspective, uh, it um, raises certain concerns and questions. Um, and um, again, you know, you kind of you know, have to look at uh, how things develop there. 
um, historically and the emergence of uh, the Communist Party of China as the leading party. Um, you know, at the same time, I think one of the one of the chief mistakes that was made in the Soviet Union uh, and also the other socialist countries that were where socialism was defeated, as John says, uh, was that the, the the Communist Party their authority was enshrined in the Constitution. Now, I I don't know if that's true in the Chinese Constitution. I haven't I haven't read it, but if it is, I would say that that's a mistake. And also that, um, you know, as, as uh, you know, the kind of civil society and political culture develops, um, I think you, you're naturally going to have the emergence of different social interest groups. And particularly when you have different classes, um, you know, you're going to have different interests that are going to be represented. And I don't think you can, um, you know, you can prevent uh, uh, these expressions uh, from crystallizing administratively. I don't think you can do that. I don't think it's effective. It, it, it has too much spillover effect into other areas, you know, of, of life and, and, and so on. So the big lesson that to me is that you have to engage, you know, you, you have to, you have to win people over through uh, democratic, you know, means and through uh, organizing and through, you know, all these kinds of things. Uh, and, you know, so if, if other, uh, you know, parties emerge, well, you, that has to be, uh, the, you know, part of the political landscape, and then you have to deal with it from there. They do have this, what they call a consultative and participatory uh, consultative body, uh, which is some kind of um, consultative body which comprises uh, five other political parties. Um, now, I don't, I can't really tell you anything more about it, except that it, it's a, it's, it's kind of, it's separate from the uh, parliamentary, from the parliament. It's kind of a, a way for, uh, you know, you know, discussions to take place about laws and uh, initiatives and priorities and, and that, that kind of thing. Um, but in any case, you know, I, it's not it's not like there's only one party, but in the actually in the electoral arena, I, I think there probably is. So I, I mean, I, I see this thing evolving and. I can't really see how it can't change, uh, you know, as the political culture develops. Okay. Um, question. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> thanks, John, for uh, painting a picture of some of the thrilling developments in China where hundreds and hundreds of millions have been lifted out of, of poverty and they're tending to shift the whole balance of world power. Uh, but we know that the class struggle continues after the Russian Revolution. And uh, in the end, yeah. I agree, socialism did never collapse in the Soviet Union, but it was overthrown. And I'm sure the Chinese leaders have analyzed that just as we're trying to. And my concern, my question, is about that aspect of the class struggle in China, where you have a very powerful, at least in terms of the capital they've accumulated, Chinese capitalist class, 
with more than one or two billionaires. Now, we've heard a lot about the personal corruption for more profit for the individual capitalists. But I can't believe they're not keen on how to change the course of China away from the goal of socialism and seizing power. And without a class conscious working class that's organized and in a strong way at their places of, of work. I'm really, you know, I'm sure we're all worried. So my question is kind of a follow up on, on Scott's in terms of uh, what's being done to, uh, I don't just mean academic Marxism and, and all of that, but to build the basic class consciousness of the huge Chinese working class. Yeah, well, I, I think that that's a uh, that's a huge issue. I mean, you're right. I mean, all the and, and it kind of goes to the last question as well. I mean, the uh, you know issues of uh, classes and class struggle. It doesn't, you know, it's part of the setup there, and you have to recognize it. Um, and you know they when it when they made these reforms to create a mixed economy you know they knew they were taking certain risks and um even by you know engaging in the global economy they knew that they were creating certain risks and it's you know the risk is that they'll lose the whole thing so i think that to me they're at least the party leadership there is aware of that those risks and again i think that's one of the reasons why some of the, the some of these reforms that's the basis of some of these reforms is to is to strengthen um, you know the the role of uh, the working class in this thing and also to put some curbs to begin to regulate more uh, the capitalist class there um, in addition the the uh, education reforms and, and again the this issue of, of Marxism and this conference and uh, you know them celebrating it, uh, Marx uh, was. I saw that as a sign that they want to elevate you know th these kinds of discussions and find find more effective ways of of um, you know introducing or at least making Marxism a much bigger part of the discussions and approaches you know all. Of society, but also um, figuring out how to to elevate people's participation in this whole thing. Because uh, if people are not engaged, if they're not drawn into the political process, that's really where the problem is to me. And that's one of the lessons of what happened in the Soviet Union. You know, people didn't fight. They didn't fight to defend socialism. And so I think that's that's all part of this process. And they, by the way, they've studied those lessons with what happened in the Soviet Union very carefully. And they've drawn, I think, they're trying to draw the right conclusions. Okay, next one, Charlie. Yeah, John, the US Euro's network was finished in 1920 with about 250,000 miles of track. Uh, the British tried to bring rail railroads into China and the, the people attacked the steam engine because they thought it was a dragon. And they were also fearful of the straight lines and so that brought bad energy into the village. But now, and even a few years ago, I was getting in programs where I'd watch films of steam engines in operation in China. Um, and then I'm told that this is a great project here. I've been to several presentations on Gulf Road, but it sounds, doesn't it, it sounds to me though as if the country is developing great railroads. It's it's not, I, I can't, it's like not really 
the biggest, like they didn't have railroads comparable to that in the States or other countries. Is it that big a development? I don't, I don't know if you know railroads, but you know, I, I'm kind of wondering if they're just getting freight railroads. You're getting what? Freight railroads. Freight? freight? Railroads. Yeah, yeah, freight. Yeah, I'm not sure. I don't John, yeah. I think you'd have to really think about those stories where they, you know, you get reported in the United States that people in other countries think things are dragons or mystical. Well, it's just a story. I know, but it, it, it really makes the people look like ignorant savages. And I think, <laughs> no, seriously, if, oh. if we hear those stories about people in, in other continents, you know, and I think we ought to re-examine them because maybe those people didn't like the railroads because they were, you know, part of the imperialism mm -hmm. or something like that. Um, but, you know, I, I just, it, 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 it rings, Offensive one of me. I don't have an answer. Okay, I guess we should uh, wrap it up, huh? Uh, well, I want to thank everybody for participating. And again, there's a lot to discuss here, and I hope we have more discussions. And I hope more people travel and also make uh, their own observations, and so we can have a much deeper understanding, a more well-rounded understanding of what's actually happening. So thank you and good night.